in this September Labor Day long weekend, for some, officially the last weekend of summer, we greet you and we welcome you to the worship and the fellowship of the Delisle Community Chapel. Whether you're here with us in the sanctuary or whether you're at home or perhaps watching us on your iPhone at the lake or some other location where you've got away one more time before the cool autumn weather, we do want to make sure that you know that we appreciate the fact that you've joined us today. So re relax and enjoy the presence of Jesus. He's here with us today by his spirit. I want to read with you today a passage from Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 18, and we're going to read 20 verses. Let's pay attention because we find Jesus teaching us some very important truths. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called the little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, Whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, Truly, I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, Take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Father God, thank you that we are in your presence now. We ask that we would have a wonderful sense of the fact that you are truly with us, that you are here among us and within us. You have promised, Jesus, that where even two or three gather in your name, you would be there. And so we know that you are here. And as we pray, God, we agree together about those things we pray for, 
knowing that it will be done for us by the Father in heaven. Today, God, we ask that you would do something in each of our lives, that you would cleanse us, that you would fill us, that you would use us, that you would make us better, braver, more beautiful people because we've had an experience with God that's real and personal. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a very special Sunday in that we're going to be sharing together in Holy Communion. If you are with us here in the sanctuary, we're going to be uh, sharing the wafer and the juice, the bread, the wine, and we're going to take special precautions in doing that, as I'll outline just prior to the sharing of communion. If you are joining us from home, then we invite you, if you've not already done so, to prepare bread and juice so that you can enter into the communion with us and we'll share in Holy Communion together as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. And now, it's my privilege to share with you the message of the morning. The disciples came to Jesus and they asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Oh boy, was that ever the wrong question. The question itself was inappropriate, and the timing could hardly have been worse. Jesus had just told them for at least the second time that he was going to be betrayed and killed. But the disciples heard only what they wanted to hear, the part about the kingdom. And now they are jockeying for position in that kingdom. Jesus saw this as a teaching moment. And he was never one to miss a teaching opportunity. So he called a little child. And he had him stand among them. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, don't worry about being the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Unless you change your attitude, you won't even be there. When I began to study this Matthew 18 passage, I noticed that it seemed to be divided into three or four separate sections, apparently unrelated to one another. Then I realized that there was a unifying image, the image of the child that links them together. So let's keep the image of the child in mind as we work through our study passage this morning. Little children, like the baby in the back, little children are completely dependent upon the loving care of their parents, grandparents, and others. Jesus calls us to be humble, and dependent, like little children, willing to admit that we need help, and willing to accept the help when it is offered. It is pride that keeps us from accepting help very often. Even on a human level, we are embarrassed to accept help. And so we struggle on carrying burdens that weigh us down, burdens that we were never intended to carry on our own. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who are willing to admit that they need God's help, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. There is a spiritual principle here. We must be willing to descend before we can ascend. Jesus humbled himself. He descended to the lowest place before being exalted 
to the highest place and given a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Jesus said, therefore, everyone who humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus continued. He said, and whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. Jesus taught that when you give help to a child or to anyone who needs help, anyone who is vulnerable for that matter, the poor, those in need of food, clothing, and shelter, those who are sick, those who are in prison. Jesus considers it the same as if you had done it for him personally. On the other hand, according to Jesus, if anyone causes someone else to sin, especially a child, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Not far from Cape Girardeau, Missouri, where we once lived, is the Bollinger Mill. It's an old mill which predates the American Civil War. The mill was made to grind corn for meal. During the war, the Bollinger family would grind corn for anyone who brought corn. But because they ground corn for Confederate soldiers, the Union soldiers returned and burned the wooden structure. The mill was rebuilt with stone this time on the same foundation, and it continued in use right up into the 1960s. In fact, uh, once a year, they still fire up the old mill, and people come from all over the place to see it in action. Today, the mill and the covered bridge next to it are preserved in a state park, which was, for me, a favorite ride destination. On display in the Bollinger Mill is a huge millstone. I mean, this thing is enormous. I can't even guess at the weight of it. But I know that if a person was to be tied to a millstone like that and dropped into the sea, well, it's obvious what would happen. They'd go down quick. Now, this is a graphic image, to be sure. But we need to remember that these words were spoken by the kindest, most loving human being who ever lived. In this broken world, it is inevitable that there will be things which cause people to stumble. But you don't want to be one of those people held responsible for causing others to sin. Jesus continued, If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Now we might well ask the question, did Jesus mean for his words to be taken literally? And the answer to that is yes and no. No, he did not mean that sinners should literally cut off their hands and feet and gouge out their eyes. But yes, he did mean that you would be better off going through life crippled and blind rather than ending up in hell. Now the word translated here as hell is Gehenna. Gehenna was the name of the valley outside of ancient Jerusalem used as the city dump. All the refuse and all the trash of the city was thrown into that valley to be burned. Now because people were constantly bringing their garbage and their waste, the fires in Gehenna never went out. Day after day, year after year, 
the smoke of Gehenna went up endlessly. Now, because Jesus loves us, he warns us against the things which would destroy us and cause us to end up in the garbage dump of life. God loves sinners, but God hates sin. We are headed for destruction if we do not recognize the seriousness of sin. We sometimes imagine God as a doting grandparent who will pat us on the head and say, there, there, it's all right. But in the eyes of God, sin is not all right. Sin is all wrong. It cost God the death of his one and only son. We are all sinners. I am a sinner. You are a sinner. We are all in need of God's forgiveness. Question. What do you call a forgiven sinner? The biblical term for a forgiven sinner is a saint. A saint. There are all kinds of sins, but there are only two kinds of sinners. The saints and the ain'ts. Those who have come to him humbly as a little child, confessing their sin and receiving his forgiveness and mercy. And those who refuse to come, who reject his free gift of forgiveness and salvation. As he hung on the cross, Jesus prayed. He prayed these words, Father, forgive them. And God forgave them. On the basis of Christ's sacrifice, his body which was pierced, his blood which was shed, God forgave them. And he not only forgave those who were present there that day, but he forgave every sin and every sinner from Adam until today. Sadly, though, there are many who have never accepted the gift of salvation which has been freely offered to us. The very first motorcycle that I ever owned was a, a small Honda, a model CB360, which I purchased from my friend Doty way back in 1977. In May of this year, I was visiting with Doty and he told me, I have another CB360. And my ears kind of perked up, and I said, really? It would be so cool to have another motorcycle like the one that I started on 40-some years ago. I said, how much would you want for this one? And his response was, not very much. Then he said, since it's your birthday, I want to give it to you as a gift. Now that was, that was pretty cool. A simple transfer of ownership was quickly drawn up. Imagine if I had refused to sign it. I would never have taken possession of what was freely given to me. What a fool I would have been. A gift offered, but never accepted. How much more tragic if we should refuse God's indescribable gift of salvation received by faith. Jesus said that we must not look down on the little ones, the children and the youths, the poor and the vulnerable, or those who are new in their faith in Jesus. And don't look down either on those who have wandered away. We tend to call them black sheep. Jesus called them lost sheep. God is not willing that any of these lost sheep should perish. He wants the lost sheep found. He wants the little ones to be brought back to him. And don't think that you are better than those who are lost. They may have their lives more under control than you do. You are not better than other people who are not Christians. 
You are only better than you would be if you weren't a Christian. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. What do we do? Instead of going to the brother, just between the two of us, we tell everyone else about how we were done wrong. You may be tempted to think, well, I'll forgive him if he comes and apologizes. According to Jesus, it is you who must take the initiative to achieve reconciliation. The objective is to bring him back into fellowship with you and with the church family. Then, if your best efforts fail, Jesus says, treat him like an unbeliever or a tax collector. Tax collectors in Jesus' time were considered to be the lowest of the low. After all, they were extorting money on behalf of an occupying foreign power. So then we ask, how did Jesus treat tax collectors? Did he shun them and make them feel like they were worthless outcasts? No. The Pharisees treated them like that. Jesus, on the other hand, was criticized for eating and drinking with them. He even called one of them to be a disciple. His name was Matthew, and he later wrote a biography of Jesus' life. We call it the book of Matthew. It's the book that we read together and are studying together this morning. He was a tax collector. The book is named for the author. Now, in Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 13, we have the story of how Jesus saw Matthew working at his tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Imagine Matthew asking, where are we going? And Jesus said, to a dinner party. Matthew said, I'm not welcome at dinner parties. And Jesus saying, you don't need to worry about this one. You're the host. Because the very next scene, Jesus is having dinner at Matthew's house. And it says in Scripture that many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with him and with his disciples. When the Pharisees questioned the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus overheard their criticism, and he responded, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus made the point that God values mercy more than sacrifice. The Pharisees were big on giving their sacrifices at the temple. But they weren't so good at extending mercy to the lost sheep. So how do you treat an unbelieving tax collector or a sinner of any kind? You do what Jesus did. You get together with him or her and share a meal. Jesus knew that sharing a meal together is a unifying experience. In fact, Jesus chose to be remembered by a shared meal, a meal of bread and wine. We call it Holy Communion. Communion is actually an abbreviated Passover meal, to which Jesus gave an additional, new, and deeper spiritual meaning. Jesus promised to be with us when we come together, especially when we come together at the Lord's table, even if there are only two or three believers present. This is my body. He said, this is my blood. To all who received him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We who believe in Jesus and seek to follow him by the help of his spirit are all God's children. We gather at the Lord's table to remember and to celebrate 
the greatest gift ever given, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. We pray. Father God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his teaching. Thank you for his love. Thank you, most of all, for his sacrifice, the giving of himself, his body, and his blood, given at Calvary. And that is why we look to the cross, not as a bloody symbol, but as a symbol of hope. We realize, God, that because of Jesus, we can experience forgiveness and salvation. And so today, at whatever point we may be in our spiritual journey, we come in faith to you. In this quiet moment, if there's any unconfessed sin, we admit it to you now. Show us if there's anything within us that needs to be dealt with here and now. Thank you for your gift of forgiveness. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen.